Great. Hi, I'm Pam Fox at pamfox.org. And in today's video, I'm going to be talking about a couple of things. Um, if you're in my 28-day anti-reflux plant-based challenge, that's not why I'm here right now. I will be back in the, ki back in the ki kitchen later tonight at 5 p.m. Um, cooking for that challenge. Right now, I was just in the hiatal hernia support group and I was reading some comments and I just wanted to come on and talk for a moment about this idea. Um, I'm just going to read a portion of this comment from a young woman named Alexandra. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, it's long, I'm just going to paraphrase it really quick. Basically, she's um, concerned because she was talking to a medical professional, I think it was an EMT or a paramedic, that was saying that people get hiatal hernias all the time, they're common, they shouldn't really cause that much problem, and when people complain about them, it's all in their head, and it's just not that big of a deal. Um, and I see this a lot, and if you're, if you're not a member of the Hiatal Hernia Support Group, that's the name of it, Hiatal Hernia Support. It's not my group, but I am a member there, and it's a large active group of people sharing their experiences with hiatal hernias, whether they are addressing them naturally, whether they are using medications, they are using surgery, a whole variety of different things. I think it's a really great support group. There's a few haters in there from time to time, but for the most part, it's a, lo it's a lot of very loving and compassionate people. Hey, Wendy. Uh, so if you do have a hiatal hernia, make sure you join that group. I do, I do recommend it. Um, but anyway, back to the topic. Um, this was my experience when I was di diagnosed with a hiatal, her a hiatal hernia. I finally got the diagnosis, but then I was told by two separate doctors that, yeah, you do have this hiatal hernia, but it shouldn't cause you any issues, any major issues anyway. And yet that was the whole reason I went to the doctor. That was the whole reason I was pursuing treatment was because of the pain and discomfort, the symptoms that I had was, was why I went and had testing in the first place and got my diagnosis. And I just want to bring up three quick points about that. If, if you have a doctor that's telling you, oh, you, we're diagnosing you with this hiatal hernia, but it shouldn't cause you any issues, think about that. People go in, you, you can't get a diagnosis, of, an official diagnosis, of, a di excuse me, an official diagnosis of a hiatal hernia without being tested, right? And a doctor is not going to give you a test unless you have symptoms of pain and discomfort. So to say that you're, so to go through an endoscopy or a barium swallow and to be diagnosed with a hiatal hernia and then told that it shouldn't cause you any issues is just illogical because you came to the doctor with issues, <laughs> right? So I would say that if you are, if you are under the medical supervision of a doctor who is really minimizing your experience, and saying, well, we see you have this hiatal hernia, but otherwise you're perfectly healthy and the hiatal hernia shouldn't cause you any, any trouble. Hey, Pamela. Um, so I, that, it would be my recommendation to seek out a, a different doctor. And I know that can be annoying because, you know, when it comes to health insurance, sometimes you only have a small pool of um, professionals that you can go to. So sometimes you have to go outside of that, which means it's gonna cost you. And it can be very frustrating. And then finding a doctor that is actually willing to help you can be difficult as, and challenging as well. And it's gonna take an effort on your part to really find that person sometimes. We don't all just get lucky and go to the first, first doctor and they are an expert in, at you know helping people with your symptoms and they have this perfect track record or a great track record of helping people with your symptoms. Um, so it can be challenging and you might have to put in additional effort to find a, a doctor that's truly gonna help you. The other point I wanted to bring up besides, um, you know, getting that diagnosis um, is the fact this, this hiatal hernia support group that I just mentioned, it's an active group. There's almost 6,000 members in it. When I say active, I mean people are posting in there daily and new people are joining daily. People are being newly diagnosed on a daily basis, which means people are suffering with high hiatal hernia. All you have to do is go in here and read what they're saying. They are suffering. They are suffering. Um, Tracy says, mine told me just learn how to live with it by diet. Yeah, and so, you know, depending on the doctor, some doctors will give, you know, they may kind of minimize it and give you a little bit of advice. That's better than nothing. That's better than just saying, well, there's nothing, we, there's nothing that can be done. 
I see that over and over again from people in the group. They say, my doctor says there's nothing they can do for my hiatal hernia. If it gets really bad, I'll recommend surgery. Okay, um, which brings me to my third point. The fact that there is a surgical option for this condition logically tells us that it's a, an important condition. <laughs> a person wouldn't go in for surgery to have something remedied unless there was really a major issue there, right? I mean, a lot of times doctors will put off a hiatal hernia surgical repair, uh, repair until like there's a strangulation or if the person's entire stomach is in their chest cavity and they're really having difficulty breathing, um, then they'll do the surgery. And why doctors put off this surgery, I personally don't understand that because doctors are quick to do a lot of other surgeries that are very risky, that come with their own set of risks, that aren't guaranteed to be a permanent fix, but they're really slow to do this particular surgery. Sometimes people have to really seek out and find a doctor that is willing to do the, the surgery. And I'm not a person that recommends, you know, going out and getting surgery for everything. I mean, I want to avoid it just like anybody else does, but there is a time and a place for it. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I, I do understand it. I know that hiatal hernia surgical repairs have a high failure rate, but cancer treatments have a high failure rate. And that doesn't stop allopathic doctors from getting people involved in conventional cancer treatments right away. Um, you know, cancer is, I guess, more of a life or death situation. But I mean, I'm just, I'm just babbling here. I, I, I don't fully understand why doctors are so slow to recommend surgery. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, it does and it doesn't. Um, so anyway, there's that. But I want to move on um, um, to why I think um, there's this, there's this um, confusion when it comes to hiatal hernias. You might have one person who was told they have a very small hiatal hernia. Oh, we see you have a very small hiatal hernia, and yet they have major symptoms, okay? And then, and then you have another person over here who's been diagnosed with a hiatal hernia, and it's really not a major issue for them. You know, they take their Nexium every day, and, you know, they get by, and they're okay, and they don't have a whole long list of symptoms. So I just want to explain that really quick to maybe help you better understand why that is. So you could take person A, maybe it's a, a young person who's slender, in really good shape, this person exercises, this person in general eats pretty healthy, healthy, and yet they've been diagnosed with a hiatal hernia and they have a high degree of pain and discomfort. So um, the thing you need to understand about a person in that situation is is that a lot of that stuff may not matter. It's really, it can come down to the anatomical positioning of that particular person's hernia. And so if you have um, your, your stomach just sitting in your, in, your, in your diaphragm just right, and there's enough pressure, let's say, for example, on your vagus nerve um, for a long enough period of time, that can start to manifest itself in severe pain and discomfort in a, in a variety of, of different symptoms. Okay, so then you can take person B, let's say person B is extremely overweight, let's say their health, their diet is, um, is admittedly not that healthy, um, they don't exercise, uh, maybe they have a variety of health conditions, and they have this hiatal hernia, and um, you know, if they forget to take their medication, then they get some heartburn, but that's about it, okay? So then why is that? Well, it can be, again, it can be because of that anatomical positioning, just the way it's seated just right, so it's not putting, you know, maybe a whole lot of pressure on the vagus nerve. Um, it could be because, you know, we have to always take into consideration, there's just a lot of different variables. One variable can be the gut microbiome. So some people, maybe they, they weren't um, exposed to high levels or frequent levels of antibiotics throughout their life. Maybe they were exposed to a lot of microbes growing up, you know, just a lot of different microbes. Maybe their parents weren't really fussy about them always bathing and washing their hands before they ate and that kind of a thing. And so they've been exposed to a lot of healthy microbes throughout their life and built up a lot of immunity. And within that gut microbiome, whenever they eat, the food just moves through pretty much with ease and the digestive system can just handle anything that goes through. And so then they don't get, you know, things like bloating or um, common constipation. Maybe they don't have a whole lot of inflammation in their gut. And so the food is just moving through with ease. 
um, and not creating things like you know constipation and bloating and inflammation that can um, then exacerbate that hiatal hernia and create more pain and discomfort. So I'm just trying to make the point that it, 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 there can be so many different variables and things that, that go into um, these different, you know, these varieties of pains and discomforts or symptoms that we experience with the hiatal hernia. Every person is different. You hear that over and over again, and it's so very true. And so then you're left um, wondering, well, then, you know, what can I do for, you know, for this pain and discomfort? And then really, I think that's part of the reason why doctors just kind of say there's nothing that can be done is because each individual hernia and each individual person is so specific, is so specific. And so one person, you know, may get relief by taking, I just, just watching, I just was reading in the group um, a couple days ago how, about how someone, it might have been in the GERD and reflex group, a different group, about how she overcame all of her digestive issues by seeing a Chinese herbalist. And she was taking all of these Chinese herbs that I, I've never heard of any of these herbs. It's all new to me. And yet she is able to fully recover from her reflex. Um, Wendy asks, what do I think about diatomaceous earth? <laughs> I have strong opinions on diatomaceous earth and personally they're all positive. Um, I don't want to get off on a sidetrack, but um, I do, I personally do use food grade diatomaceous earth. I don't take it every single day. I usually will do a course of it. Like I will take a teaspoon a day for two weeks and I'll do that maybe two or three times a year. It's rich in silica, it's rich in minerals. And although um, I can't find any um, studies, any uh, like peer reviewed studies on diatomaceous earth, I'll admit I haven't looked really deep for that. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, um, a, a lot and a variety of anecdotal evidence uh, for the benefits of diatomaceous earth. And so that's why I personally started experimenting with it. And I have done a couple of videos on it because um, when I first started experimenting with it, it was years ago when I was kind of at the peak of my general illness. Just, I was very, very sick in a variety of different ways. And so, you know, out of desperation, I was just always trying different things. And when I tried that diatomaceous earth, it didn't fix me. It didn't fix all of my problems. But here's, here's what happened, Wendy. I'd been experiencing night sweats for 10 years. Every single night soaking, dripping wet, <laughs> night sweats. This was like started when I was about 30 years old. And when I was about 40 years old, I, I heard about di diatomaceous earth I, and, I, and I did a, a, um, like a two week, you know, a tea, teaspoon a day and like a shot of water every day for two weeks. And I kid you not, that 10 year daily, nightly night sweats, extreme night sweats, but I'd tried a lot of things. I tried, you know, using different types of sheets, different types of blankets, different types of pajamas, you know, sleeping with the window open, um, making sure I was hydrated before I went to bed. I was trying all of these different things. Nothing ever made a difference. I took the diatomaceous earth and those night sweats went away and they have never come back. So I do, I will do a course of diatomaceous earth probably quarterly, every three months or so, I will do a two week series of a teaspoon of diatomaceous earth in a shot of water once a day. That's what I've done. And I, um, I, um, you know, again, everybody's gonna be different. I've heard people testify that they tried diatomaceous earth and it made them very sick. I've heard one person say that actually. So anyway, um, Brenda says my problem is my throat feels raw so I can't swallow solid foods and I also have a burning tongue yeah yeah that's pretty common um, that's pretty common you've got irritated tissues in the throat that that need to heal in order for you to be able to start you know eating regularly again um, okay so I want to get back on track so um, so yes everybody's hiatal hernia is different and um, everybody's remedy for hiatal hernia and digestive distress is going to vary. You know, different people are going to have different um, success stories where they went down different paths. You know, I'm always telling people in order to overcome the symptoms of a hiatal hernia, you need to address your hiatal hernia, which means you need to unherniate your stomach. And that's easier said than done for some people. Some people have very large, very old hiatal hernias. I was just reading, um, I gotta keep 
I gotta keep track of the time. I was just reading a comment in the hiatal hornea support group from a gentleman who just had surgery. And after his surgery, he said his doctor had never seen a hiatus that large before. So the hiatus is the hole, it's the little tiny hole in your diaphragm. So if your diaphragm sits here underneath your rib cage, that's the hole that your esophagus comes through. So with the hiatal hernia, now your stomach has come through that hole, that hiatus. So this guy was saying his doctor said he'd never seen a hiatus that big before. In fact, he said he could have put his whole fist through his hiatus, okay? So what I teach is, is anatomy, understanding your hiatal hernia, understanding what caused your hiatal hernia so you can stop doing the things that are, keep, that are still pushing your stomach up. All of this, you know, comprehensive information to help you then learn how to master moving your stomach down while you're not doing things that keep pushing it up. Right, and so then once you learn that, then you um, tighten that hiatus. In other words, you take that hole, that little hole that's become very enlarged, and you tighten it back up again through exercise. And this was the this is something I really kind of wanted to focus on in this live because every time I go into the hiatal hernia support group, I hear people who have really done a lot of important things to reverse their and address their hiatal hernia but I never hear anyone talking about this one thing, and that is shrinking their hiatus, tightening their hiatus, okay? That's like the final piece of this comprehensive puzzle to reversing your hiatal hernia. People don't seem to either get that far or they disregard it like it's not important or they don't know about it or, or they think they can't do it or maybe they start doing it and they realize this is gonna take a while and they kind of forget about it. I know when I started going down the path to tightening my hiatus, I started feeling a lot better. I started having zero symptoms. So I stopped doing the exercise and then the symptoms kind of crept back in. So then I started doing the exercises again and then I would have zero symptoms. So I would stop doing the exercise. It's kind of like, were you guys ever like a kid and you were you got like an earache and you went to the doctor and they sent you home with a bottle of amoxicillin and they said, make sure you take it all, which is really, really important. We understand that and we're experiencing the consequences of that today um, with bacteria and, uh, and mutating. Um, anyway, so how many of you would get halfway through that bottle of amoxicillin and stop taking it because you felt better, even though your doctor said, you know, make sure you take it all. Um, this is kind of what happens, I think, when people start to experience uh, freedom from their symptoms, they stop doing the work. And so when it comes to reversing, to effectively reversing your hiatal hernia, you really have to understand that you, you have to keep your, your diaphragm strong and healthy for the rest of your life if you wanna prevent another herniation. I go like this because that's the stomach coming back up into your diaphragm, right? So I'm gonna show you really quick, we're just gonna go through, um, Allison's like, Allison says, I can get stomach down, but can't always tell if it's up or down and struggling to tighten hiatus. Okay, I'm gonna talk about that now, Allison. But that's good news that you can get your stomach down. Some people work at that and work at that and work at that, and it doesn't work, and so then they work more aggressively and then they hurt themselves. So the fact that you've been able to get your stomach down, figure out how to be able to effectively do that is a really, really, uh, that's really good news, and that's a great first step. Um, another great first step is just understanding all of the different ways we can create intragastric pressure. I go like this, symbolizing the stomach moving up into the diaphragm. Um, we have to make sure we understand what we're individually doing as individuals that moves our stomach up so that we can take charge of that, right? We have control over those things and we, we need our stomach to be down. And so if we're always doing things that move it up, we need to be aware of those things as much as possible. So, um, Strengthening your and tightening your hiatus. You guys have all heard of diaphragmatic breathing exercise. These are the exercises that singers do to keep their diaphragm strong, right? So those exercises actually push your stomach up, which is not what we want. We want the opposite. Those of us with the hiatal hernia want our stomachs to move down, right? Because if you have a hiatal hernia, your stomach is pushed up into the diaphragm. We want the stomach to move down, okay? so. These diaphragmatic breathing exercises, you can go and Google them now and you'll see that the instructions will tell you to 
you know, take in a deep breath and expand, expand your lungs, you know, and, and then when you exhale, you, you pull in your belly button. How many of you guys have ever taken an exercise class, a yoga class, an aerobics class, where you hear your instructor saying, pull your belly button in, um, engage your core, you know, all of that kind of stuff. That engagement of the core, that pulling the belly button in, that pushes your stomach up. And so it's really not, it's not hard. It's just, you gotta do these diaphragm breathing exercises without pulling in your belly, without engaging your core, without sucking in your gut. And so this can take practice, but anybody can do this. And um, there's a real emphasis on two things with diaphragm, and I'll, and I'll go through it here in just a second, and then I've gotta go to work. Ah, shoot, I gotta go to work right now. Okay, I'll be, I'll be a couple minutes late for work. <laughs> Two things really important, and these are so important. Um, I know that people disregard these all the time, like they're not that important, and they think, oh, I just need to take really, really deep breaths. One, you have to relax your abdominal muscles. So you need to do the deep breathing exercises in a very relaxed state. Do the deep breathing exercises and keep your focus on relaxation, specifically of your abdominal muscles, okay? That's, that's the number one thing. That's the number one thing. And if you start to feel lightheaded or dizzy when you do these exercises, stop and breathe normal and then come back to it. You don't have to do 10 breathing exercises in, or deep breaths in a row. You can do one and then breathe naturally and then do another one. You could do 10 individual inhalation, exhalation exercises throughout the day all split up. The point isn't to do you know, really deep breathing. The point is to take your diaphragm through a full range of motion all the way up and all the way down. Just like when, you know, if you're doing a bicep curl, you wanna go through, you wanna come all the way up and down. You know, if you just came in here and did like this, shallow, you want it all the way up and all the way down, and you want to work the muscle, which means, you know, take it through the full range of motion and hopefully put a little bit of resistance. So you put a little hand weight in there. Well, that's a little bit more difficult when it comes to breathing, although there are some ways you can add resistance to this, but we're not gonna talk about that right now because that's more advanced. Um, but you want to take that diaphragm all the way up and all the way down. That's why we do deep breathing. And it doesn't have to be a labored, forced, um, aggressive deep breathing. It just needs to be as full, breathe in as far as you can, and then breathe out all the way. Number two, this is the other key. When you exhale and you're keeping your abs relaxed throughout the inhale and the exhale, abs are relaxed. Doesn't matter if you breathe through your nose and your mouth, none of that matters. Do what's comfortable and feels natural to you. But your abs got to be relaxed, and this takes practice. So number two is that diaphragm, in order to you know, move it all the way up and all the way down, when we exhale, we've got to blow all that air out. And here's what the conventional diaphragmatic exercise teacher will tell you. To blow all that air out and keep blowing and keep blowing and pull in those abs, and that will push that diaphragm up, 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 higher, 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 and deflate your lungs fully deflate your lungs. So we don't wanna do that. We wanna keep the abs as relaxed as possible when we fully exhale. And we want to blow all of that air out when we fully exhale. And when we think we have fully exhale, you wanna blow out even more air. And it's there. It's right there in that moment that you thought you've blown out all the air and then you push out a little bit more. You know, like when you're blowing out your birthday candles and you're Oh, you're blowing and you're blowing and you're blowing and you're blowing and oh, you still have three more candles and even though you're out of air, you still keep blowing, right? That's the same idea. So you're, you're, you're deflating, you blow out, blow out, blow out, blow out, and then when you think you've blown out all the way, you blow out a little bit more. But at no time do you, you pull in your abdominal muscles. And what happens in that moment is that diaphragm is being isolated and it's being forced to do all that work by itself without any help from your abs. You see what I'm saying? So we're working that muscle. It's a muscle. It's a skeletal muscle. And so what we're trying to do is we've got a nice weakened, flabby, tired old hiatus. And if we do these exercises every day, like I said, do you start with five breaths a day. And you can break it up if you want to. Do two in the morning and two at night. But consistency, that's the third key. <laughs> you gotta do it every day. You've gotta make it a practice. I, I reversed my hiatal hernia months ago. Gosh, it's been almost a year now. And I still do, I try to do two or three of these breaths every day. Big deal, right? 
That's it, to maintain the strength and keep my hiatus, my diaphragm healthy and strong. To keep my hiatus tight. We wanna keep it tight. Okay, so one, keep the abs relaxed. Two, fully exhale. Okay, make sure so that you get that diaphragm to work. I'm trying to work that diaphragm. Get it all the way up, all the way down. Um, and consistency. Consistency, do the, do the practice. Make it a practice every day. Okay, and guys, one more time, if you get dizzy, just stop and breathe normal. And make sure you're doing it in a seated position or something so that if you do pass out, you don't clunk your head. Make sure you're sitting up tall, okay? You don't wanna be all slouched over. Um, you can recline, so you take a little bit of pressure off of your hernia when you're doing this. Um, I know someone told me that they prefer to kind of do it in a, not like a slouching position, but kind of a, a leaning forward position which I can see why that would be comfortable. Get in a position that's comfortable for you, you know? And if, and if you do this every day for a week and you don't notice any difference, yeah, it, it takes, it's a muscle and it's gonna take time. And if yours is really big, if you can put your fist through your hiatus, I honestly don't even know if you can tighten it up to that degree. I don't know if you can. I don't know how tight that you, small you could get that hole. But there's only one way to find out, and that's to practice these breathing techniques. Um, but you have to understand the, comprehensive, the comprehensiveness of this. There is usually not just one thing that's going to reverse your hiatal hernia, like an exercise like this. It's comprehensive. There's usually a variety of things that you need to do to support that healing. Okay? Um, so, yeah, you have to be up for the task. <laughs> you have to be up for the task. You have to be the type of person that says, you know, I can do this or I can at least give it a try because I don't want to have to do surgery. And I don't want to have to take these pills for the rest of my life. Kit's asking, how about raising your arms while doing the breathing? Well, the thing about raising the arms, um, Kit, um, it can be good and it can be bad. When we raise our arms up, okay, because everything is connected, the rib cage, the arms rise up, the rib cage rises up, and your rib cage is connected to your diaphragm, so your diaphragm rises up. And so the reason this is good is because with the hiatal hernia, we want that diaphragm to come up, okay? We want the stomach to move down. And so for some people, you know, simply getting into positions like this, leaning to your right, reaching up over the head, can create that separation because the diaphragm is being moved up. It's anatomically being moved up. Okay. For other people, some people can't even lift their hands this high without, you know, extreme pain in their hernia and radiating pain. Um, because when they, because when the, when the diaphragm lifts up, it, the stomach is so lodged in there that, um, that it takes the stomach with it and the stomach is trying to move out and then there's additional pressure on the stomach and on the diaphragm and on the nerves. Um, and that can create exacerbated symptoms. So again, everyone is gonna be different and that's why we really have to just try different things. And again, it goes back to why so many medical professionals say there's nothing that can be done for your hiatal hernia. Or in the case of, hi Alexandra, <laughs> we're just talking about you. Um, in the case of Alexandra's comment, you know, um, it's all in your head. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, well, um, I do have to get going to work, so uh, I will read your comment, Alexandra. It's long, so I don't see the whole thing there. So I have to get going to work. But thank you so much, everybody, for joining me today. Um, remember that um, I am leading the 28-day anti-reflex plant-based challenge. So um, if you haven't joined that, it's not too late. You can go over to the challenge, the 28-day anti-reflex plant-based challenge on Facebook and request to join. I'm in the kitchen on Tuesdays and Thursdays cooking um, adapted recipes that have no common trigger foods or no common trigger food ingredients in them and they are also plant-based. So it's a 30 day or 28 day plant-based challenge. For those of you that would like to try a plant-based challenge or just learn what it's about, you can just follow along if you like and, and learn and observe. Um, so that's it, all right. Thank you all so much for watching and hopefully we'll see you uh, later today at five o'clock in the kitchen.